All right, class, we're still in the one categorical variable part three notes on confidence intervals. In the last video, we talked to the idea of what a confidence interval is and how that the normal curve rule or that 68, 95, 99.7 rule can help us there. We're now going to do another example of doing a confidence interval. So reading through example two, Again, some things to do is to maybe highlight and figure out the important stuff here. So we have an assembly line that is interested in estimating the proportion of items that are defective. So take a systematic sample of 1,500 items and found that 45 of them were defective. We're going to estimate that with 99% confidence. All right, so writing down the information we already know, so we sampled 1,500 items. We found of those that 45 were defective. So our p hat is going to be 45 out of 1,500, which is 0 .03. That might seem like a really small number, but we probably actually hope that the proportion of defective items uh, is a pretty small number since we don't like to have defective items. So if you remember, there were four steps for doing a confidence interval, so we're going to do them all here again. So our first step is to define the parameter in words. Here our parameter is P. Remember, parameter is a population numerical summary. P is our population proportion. Here it's of defective items. on this assembly line. So that's what we want to know. So what percent of all of the items on this assembly line are defective? Step two is our conditions. And if you remember, conditions will be on your formula sheet. So I've pulled up the formula sheet here. And so we're working still in the proportion of one sample. Here's the confidence interval that we're going to be doing. And again, right next to it are those conditions. So here are the conditions that we're going to be checking. So we first want to check our sampling method. So it says I took a systematic sample. Remember how a systematic sample is done? So maybe they took every hundredth item that came off of this assembly line. At least from what's provided here, there's no known bias. Like if they took them maybe all from the morning shift or all from the night shift, that might be a certain type of bias. But at least from what we know, there's nothing out there to make us concerned. Then we need our n times our p hat, so n is 1,500, p hat is 0 0.03, so we get 45, which is at least 10. Notice 45 was how many of the items actually were defective, so that's really what that number is doing there. And then we take our n times 1 minus p hat. Or this is going to give us how many of the items were not defective. Which is also at least 10. So all of our conditions are met here. The next step is to actually do the formula, or actually construct our confidence interval. So again, looking at the formula sheet, here's our formula for the confidence interval. We already know p hat is 0 0.03. We already know n is 1,500. The only other thing that we need to find is that z. And if you remember, z is based upon how confident we are. So that's where that 99% is going to be helpful for us. So let's first start by drawing our picture so we know how we're going to go to the table. So we're trying to find our z, z is centered at zero. However confident we are, 
goes in the middle, so we're 99% confident, which is 0.99 in decimal form. 1% left over, split it up on either side, so we get 0 0.005 on either side. If you're afraid you might get off on how many decimal places there, make sure if you add all three numbers, you should get one, or 100% when you're done there. So we're going to go to the table looking for everything to the left of our question mark there. So we're going to take our 0.99 plus that 0 0.005. So we're going to go to the table looking for 0 0.9950. So we bring up our table. Look for our jump. So we're somewhere around here. Working over the closest thing we got. So we have two that are the same distance, so you pick either one. I'm perfectly happy. I'm going to pick this one, the 0.9951. That'll give me a z-score of 2.58. And now that I have my z-score, I can plug those numbers into my formula. Alright, so we start with our p hat, which is 0 0.03. We're going to subtract off our z times the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. And then we have the same thing on the other side, except for a plus sign between them. So if you compare this to our formula here, this is just what we're doing. And then once you have the number, it's just a matter of doing the math. So making sure you do your order of operations right. Again, I'll probably show you a little bit more work than most of you will do. I just need to see what you started with and what you end with. That's all I need. So doing my little square root part first. Then I'm going to do my multiplication. And then finally the subtraction and addition. So we should get 0 0.0186 to 0 0.0414. Or if we prefer, we can put that in percentage form. So that would be 1.86% to 4.14%. And again, generally the percents are easier for us to interpret. And that's our last step, is to interpret. So we get to say how confident we are. So I am 99% confident. That, and then we're going to do our interval. So that between 1.86% and 4.14%. Of this assembly's items, are defective. Yeah, nothing new so far, just another example. 
And so then a follow-up based upon our above interval. Could we conclude that less than 4% of the items are defective? Why or why not? Well, look at what we said here. We just said we were 99% confident that between 1.86% and 4.14% of this line's items are defective. So would you feel good in saying it's less than 4%? Now the answer here should be no, but a lot of students would say yes. A lot of the reasons why people want to say yes is they look at that interval and want to say, well, most of the interval is less than 4%. But here's something about a confident interval. Even though I have this kind of maybe wide range of numbers, I'm not putting any more trust in one of those numbers than the other. So like one end is no more special than the middle is. No matter what number we're looking at inside that interval, we're not saying that one of those is more likely to happen than another. So even though just part of the interval is, le is above 4%, that's the problem here. So our answer here should be no, because the entire confidence interval is not less than 4%. So again, even though this part of it's a little high, we're not putting any more trust in one number inside that interval than any other. All right, we'll get to another example of this in a little bit. But first, something a little bit newer. We've talked a lot about how sample size plays a role in things. So how big of a sample size do we need? It'd probably be very good to know that before we go out and collect data to either one, find out we don't have enough data, or two, we spent too much time and money and we didn't need that much. So how much data do we need to collect? Well, it depends upon what your goals are. So what we're looking at formula-wise is this margin of error. So formula-wise, that's our z times the square root of that p hat times 1 minus p hat over n or the z times that standard error term that we've talked about. So what we can do is take this part of the equation and solve it for n. And what we find is that our sample size needs to be at least as big as z over our margin of error squared times p hat times 1 minus p hat. Now, I don't expect you to solve the equation for n, so you can just trust the formula. You'll see that this formula is also on your formula sheet here for you, so it's something that's going to be provided. But let's talk about what that means that we need to know. So we need to know z. So if we need to know z, we need to know how confident do you want to be. Do you need to be 99% confident, or are you willing to just be 95% confident? So I need you to be able to tell me that. I need you to be able to tell me a margin of error. How far off are you willing to be? Do you need to be within 1%, or are you okay with being within 2%? Do you need to tell me how far off you're willing to be? And both of those things seem like a pretty reasonable request. Tell me how confident you want to be, Tell me how far off you're willing to be. But the last thing I actually have to know is p hat. And that's the weird one. So if you think about what p hat is, p hat is a sample proportion. So we get that from our sample. So if we have not collected a sample yet, how do we have a sample proportion? So generally this is something that we're not already going to know before we collect our data. It's something we get after our data. So as mentioned over here, what can we do about this p hat? So there are two different things that we can do to plug in for p hat. The first thing that we can do is use p hat from a previous similar study. So maybe a business is doing the same type of study year after year. And so we can use last year's estimate to help us have an idea of what p hat is going to be. And a pretty reasonable thing to do. But every now and then we're doing something totally new. Or maybe I don't have a p hat from a previous similar study. What would I do then? If I have nothing else to use, we use a p hat of 0.5. The reasoning 
This results in the largest possible n. If you plug anything else in for the p hat, you will get a smaller n than if you plug in 0.5. This is sort of your safe covering your butt um, type way of doing it. So reasonable to request how confident they want to be, how far off they're willing to be. P hat we might need a little bit of help with. So let's do a couple of examples here. So in example three, we're trying to estimate the proportion of people who believe in ghosts. How large of a sample should we take so that the margin of error is no more than 1% with 95% confidence? So we have some key numbers there for us. Of course, reading the problem, it asks us how large n should be. So we know we're going to be finding n. So let's talk about what we know. So we know here already the margin of error they're willing to have is 1% or 0 0.01. They want to be 95% confident. But remember that percent confidence is not actually what our z is. We need to draw our picture to find our z. So again we put how confident we want to be in the middle. 5% left over get split up to two and a half percent on either side. So we're going to go to the table looking for everything to the left of that question mark. So we're going to be looking for 0 0.9750. We go to our table. That's when we actually find perfectly so our z-score is going to be 1.96. Now again, as a reminder, when you're finding that z, the only thing that affects that is your percent confidence. Sample size, p-hat, none of those things affect our z-score. So now I have my z. The last thing I need is p-hat. So first, do I already have a p hat from a previous similar study? Well, from reading what I have here, I don't know of one. There probably has been a, a similar study on ghosts, but I don't have that number here to use. So since I don't have anything else, we're going to use the 0.5. So there's none given, that's why we're choosing that. Right, now that we have all of our numbers, we can plug them into our equation that we have up here. So our sample size will need to be at least, least as big as our z, which is 1.96, over our margin of error of 0 0.01 squared times p hat times 1 minus p hat. We should get 9,604. So we need to sample 9,604 people or more. Now how this is useful, so then they can stop here and say, okay, can we sample 9,604 people? If that's possible, great, go do it. What if you don't have enough time and money to sample 9,604? Well, you're going to have to be willing to compromise on some things over here then for me. Maybe are you willing to be less confident? Why do I say less confident? Well, that would make my z-score smaller if we're less confident, so that would give me a smaller sample size. Are you willing to have a larger margin of error? So instead of being within 1%, are you okay with being within 2% instead? Why more for that one? Well, since that one's in the denominator, if I make that number bigger, I'm going to make my overall n smaller. P hat, I can't really change here unless they give me something to go off of. So it's mainly the z and the margin of error that we look at possibly changing. All right, example four. In a small study, we found that 80% of graduating seniors plan on going to college. In order to estimate p now, how large of a sample should be taken so that the margin of error is no more than 1.5% with 99% confidence. All right, so let's figure out things that we know. So we know our margin of error, that's how close they want to be within, so 
in decimal form is 0 0.015. We need to find our z by drawing our picture. I'm going to assume that you'd be okay with doing that. If you go back here, it's the same picture that we have here in example 2 because it's 99% confident. So our z is going to be 2.58. And then we need something for p-hat. Do we have a p-hat from the previous similar study? Yep, so we have this 80% of graduating seniors. So we can use that value for our p-hat. Now that we have all those values, we can plug them in to our formula up here. So our sample size will need to be at least as big as our z of 2.58 over our margin of error of 0 0.015 squared times p hat times 1 minus p hat. Doing the math here, you should get 4,733.4. And notice here we're sampling people. We can't sample 0.4 people. So what should we do? Well, this is one time your typical rounding rules will not apply, and that's because of how I've written this formula. N has to be at least as big as this number. So if I round this down, it's not at least that big. So if I have to sample part of the person, no matter how small of them, I'm going to have to round that up to sample the whole person. So I'm going to have to sample at least 4,734 graduating seniors. So one thing to note, what would have happened if we would have used a p hat of 0.5 on this example? I said it should result in the largest possible n. Well, how much bigger would it be? So if you would have used a p hat of 0.5, how much would that have had an effect? What you'll find out is your n would have to be at least as big as 7,396. So we're looking at about 2,700 more graduating seniors that you would have had to sample. So that what we choose for PHAT can make quite a big difference in what your sample size will turn out to be. Okay, technically here that leaves off all of the new stuff in the set of notes. All we have left in the set of notes here is another example. This example is actually one I've pulled off of a previous test. So what's good here is maybe to go ahead and pause it Try to work all parts A, B, and C, and see if you agree. All right, so let's see how we did. So your N should have been 500. Your P hat should have been 0 .308, the 154 out of the 500 there. For step one, your parameter, we want to know the population proportion of smokers who quit with the company C's product. Checking our conditions. They just took a random sample, they didn't be any more specific, so we'll assume it's a simple random sample. From what we know, it's no known bias. Again, we don't know that they're only sampling people who smoke less than a pack a day or something like that. Taking our N times P hat, we get 154, the number that did quit. And our N times 1 minus P hat, we get the number that started smoking again, which was 346. First, to find our formula, I found my z-score, and again, I showed the work behind that one, so how confident you are goes in the middle. Should have got a z-score of 1.96. Plugging all the numbers in here, should have got about 26.75% to 34.85%. And this is a little aside here from some of the terms from the last video. The 0 .0206 number is what we call the standard error. The 0 .0405 is what we call that margin of error. So just a little reminder about that terminology there. So not something you, of course, need in your answer. Step four is our interpretation. So now we believe that we are 95% confident that between our 26.75% and 34.85% of smokers are able to quit here with company C's product. Now, based upon your interval, 
we want to know here if we could say that company C was better than company B. Company B has a 26% success rate. So could we say that? Well, our answer was 26.75% to 34.85%. So since our entire confidence interval is greater than the 26%, we should be able to say yes. In part C, you're asked to find a sample size. How many smokers do we need to sample? This time the margin of error, they want to be within 3%. They're more confident, so our Z change to be 2.58. This was the same picture we drew in example two, so I'm not gonna draw it here again. And since it's a similar study, we're going to use the P hat from above, our 0.308. Doing the math, should it be 1576.4? Again, have to sample part of the person, we round up to 1577. All right, so hopefully we think confidence intervals maybe are a little bit easier than hypothesis tests. I also want to show you, though, before we end the video, that you can actually double check your confidence interval formula in StatCrunch as well. So let's do that here real quick. So bring up your StatCrunch in the same way we were before. Just going to open StatCrunch here. And I'm going to go to the same menu I did with the hypothesis test in the one categorical variable part two notes. So we're going to just go to the stat, proportions, one sample with summary, just as the other set of notes directs you to. We put in the two numbers that construct our P hat. So we had 154 out of our 500 smokers quit. But now, instead of doing a hypothesis test, I'm just going to click confidence interval. And then we can enter how confident we are. So this one was 95%. If it was 99%, I would just change that to 0.99. So I can make my numbers here match what my confidence level is. And that's all you need to worry about. Then we're going to hit compute. And so some numbers that you see here. So you see the P hat, that 0.308 that we calculated, that standard error, that 0.020646 number that we calculated in the middle of our formula here. So that number. And then you're given the lower limit and the upper limit. And those are actually your two endpoints. So the lower limit is 0.2675. The upper limit is 0.3485 which is what we got. So just a nice way of being able to double check your answer like when you're doing homework or you're doing the extended assignments that you'll be able to look that up.